Well, good morning, Walden Church. It is the July 4th weekend, and so we hope that you'll be celebrating 4th of July in a fun and safe way, surrounded by family and friends. Uh, today, I want to pose the question, why did the colonists first come to America? Why? We would say freedom, right? Colonists first came to America because they wanted freedom, okay? What kind of freedom? Maybe you'd say political freedom, right? No more king, no more leader who wasn't chosen by the people and for the people. One example of political liberty is the government in the Plymouth Colony in Massachusetts. The people there elected a governor and later they elected representatives to their government. The first colonists also wanted religious freedom. Under the old system, there was only one way to do it. There was only one voice to listen to, only one voice to obey. And in Europe, the government punished people for practicing other faiths. The colonists also came to America for economic opportunity. People wanted a freedom to forge their own destiny, make their own path. In the colonies, people had more opportunities to trade goods, farm land, America was a place where colonists were free to do things differently. It was an opportunity to have a better life. And today, we call that the American dream. So, the United States is a country where individual rights and self-government are extremely important, and that makes us who we are. America was a new thing. It was a bold and new idea, and because it was new, a lot of critics at that time said, this isn't going to work. But today we are celebrating our 247th birthday. So I think it worked. All because the first colonists said, out with the old, in with the new. Now, can you imagine if those things that made America new and great slowly started to disappear? What if we went back to the old ways? The First Amendment of the United States Constitution begins, Congress shall make no law establishing a religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So religious freedom is more than just the freedom to worship at a synagogue or a church or a mosque. It means people shouldn't have to go against their core values and beliefs in order to conform to the culture or in order to conform to the government. Religious freedom protects people's right to live, speak, and act according to their beliefs peacefully and publicly. It protects their ability to be themselves at work or at school or in any social activity. But what happens when the government steps in and says, oh, there's way too many religions. There's too many practices. None of you are getting along. So we're gonna go back to the old way. We're gonna have one faith and one faith leader. What if we went back to having a king? Would that work? I mean, the king is the ruler for life, unless he steps down. And it's usually revered as the sovereign leader of the nation. In some countries, the king acts as absolute ruler over all people in absolute monarchy. The president usually has a limit on their terms. Some nations also set a limit on the number of terms a president can occupy. What if we leveled the field with economic opportunity? Just eliminated all of the extra rich and eliminated the extra poor. We gave everybody the same amount of money. Gave the kid who flips burgers the same pay as the doctor who performs heart surgery. Would that work? Would America still be great? Would her ideals still be new? Would we be making advances? Would we be going forward? No, we'd be going backwards, right? We'd be getting worse, not better. Okay, so hold that thought. And let me ask you, just to change subjects, but let's keep that same thinking. Should the church be new? Should the church be new? You know, we've been talking these past four weeks about out with the old, but the rest of that saying is in with the new. We are 
the church of Jesus. Yes? What was Jesus' message? Was Jesus' message old? Or was Jesus' message new? And if it was new, are we still new? Or have we gone back to practicing some of the old things? True, there are a lot of old things that are foundational, bedrock, core beliefs that should never be thrown out because if you throw out the foundation, then it ceases to stand. But sometimes we hold on to old practices and old traditions that hold us back, that keep us from going forward. In fact, when Jesus came, he brought a whole bucket of new, and his followers were early adopters. They were ready. They were excited for change, but his opponents were more in favor of holding on to the way we've always done it. Today, I want to have an open mind and just ask ourselves, why are some things important to hold on to? Are they because Jesus told us to do them? Or are they just because we are set in our ways? About 63% of America calls themselves Christians today. Now that might sound like a lot, but 50 years ago, that number was closer to 90%. And I bet that number is gonna keep slipping down if we don't do something about it. So what's the answer? How do we turn this around? How do we get more of our neighbors, more unbelievers to church? Hold on, because we have an even bigger problem than that. Christians don't even attend church. If the USA says there are 63% of us that are Christians, that's 210 million. Only 28% of U.S. adults now say they attend church or a religious service in person at least once a month. So that's regular attendance, in person at least once a month. Of course, there are lots more that attend at Christmas and Easter, but people who come regularly, 28% of America. So just forget trying to get the lost to come to church. We can't even convince our own to come to church. That tells me that we're doing something wrong. Why don't people like church? It's not because we've added new things. Maybe because the stuff we threw out a long time ago, it crept back. We all agreed these things should be gone and they slowly crept back. We're still holding on to things that hold us back. Maybe you know somebody who's had a bad experience from church and they left, you know, and they said that they would never come back. I bet you the reason they won't come back has nothing to do with Jesus. What is church? Or rather, what should it be? We're a community, right? The church is a community of people who love and who follow Jesus and we should make it very clear on how to do that. What did Jesus say were his top three things that we should all do? You should know them. We've been covering them for a month. <laughs> love God, love each other. Wait, is there only two? Well, the third would be to love each other, even your enemies, right? Loving each other goes even further than your friends. It goes to your enemies. And I bet you anyone who resists church or they speak ill of Christians it isn't because of any one of those three things. I hope, I hope you don't disagree on any one of those three things. When asked about how to inherit eternal life, that was the answer. That was the answer on how to inherit eternal life. When asked to summarize all of the law and the prophets, that was the answer. When the early church was persecuted, it was not because they had shifted from their mandate. No, they were persecuted because of their message. Their message was, Jesus is king. Problem was, they lived in a country that already had a king. And those first Christians were thrown into the arena, they were burned, they were fed to lions, because they had more allegiance, more loyalty to Jesus than government. 
For the first church, politics was a distant third. Jesus was first. He was on their lips more than Caesar. And when it became time to obey the law or obey God, they chose God. I only wish that was our problem today. I wish that our persecution and the reason people spoke ill of us was because of our message, that our message was Jesus is king. But typically, if people have a problem with the church today, it's for another reason. I think we need once again to say, out with the old, in with the new. Paul said it so much better than me. Second Corinthians says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We learned a lot about Paul at Vacation Bible School on one of those days. And I tell you, even watching his story through a VBS cartoon, I was floored. Gamaliel is the, Gamaliel the Elder was the first century Jewish rabbi who was the leader of the Jewish Sanhedrin. He was the son of Simeon ben Hillel and grandson of the great Jewish teacher Hillel the Elder. So what? Well, Paul was his disciple, which means Saul's family was wealthy because he basically went to the Harvard of religious school. And he would have begun sitting under this rabbi maybe by his earliest third grade. Saul later becomes a member of the Sanhedrin himself. So right away we know that Paul is a man of means and power. And when this early church begins to start, Saul is so devoted to the old ways that he hunts down and arrests Christians. In fact, the entire reason he makes this Damascus journey is to grab Christians who've left his jurisdiction. And Jesus stops him, blinds him, and changes his name. Why? Because it's out with the old and in with the new. The old has passed away and behold, the new has come. Paul became the living embodiment of the change that takes place when we follow Jesus. He became the example of out with the old, in with the new. And if Paul can do it, then we can too. Jesus says in Revelation, and behold, I make all things new. Jesus made old legs walk. He made old eyes see. And time and time again, Jesus broke. He literally broke traditions that people were holding on to. One example is the woman at the well. We've been talking about that for the past few weeks. Traditionally, men did not speak to unmarried women without a chaperone. And you certainly didn't talk about religion with women. But Jesus changed the definition of who was in and who was out. What did Jesus make new? Three things, people, places, and punishment. What do I mean that Jesus made people new? Matthew 20, Jesus called them and said, you know the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus leveled the field. He removed hierarchy in a society that was based on men as leaders, rulers, and teachers. Jesus allowed women to be his disciples. He spoke to women. He spoke to children. And he ate with sinners. And the early church followed his teaching. Galatians says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Romans says, for God shows no partiality. And this equality goes all the way to the church. First Peter 2 says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people 
for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. When the Bible says that you are a royal priesthood and that you may proclaim, that means that in Jesus' church, each of you is a minister. Each of you is capable of reading the text for yourself and preaching the good news. You do not need an earthly mediator. Matthew 27 says the temple curtain was torn in two when Jesus died, thus eliminating the need for a high priest. The Bible says Jesus was the last high priest. Out with the old. No more high priests. Your last high priest is Jesus, and he is the only high priest you will ever need. Hebrews 4 says we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. And this is the tough one for many. Because for centuries we have had priests and popes and holy men who have spoken for God. But the Bible says Jesus was the last high priest. And now the church exists on the basis of the priesthood of all believers. Together, we collectively do the ministry. And none of us are more important than the other. Jesus is our high priest because only he is perfect. Only he will never fail us. He is always near. He is always available to us. And he is the only one who can make atonement for our sins. So how do we do in with the new? Here, how do we do in with the new? Well, Jesus' church should point to Jesus and not the pastor. Jesus' church should have every member involved in ministry. We are all priests. I guarantee you, churches where the pastor is the boss and the buck stops with him and it's what he says goes, those churches are not growing as fast as the churches where everyone rolls up their sleeves and works together, where the leadership and the direction is shared where everyone has a voice, and where everyone is treated equally. What do I mean that Jesus made places new? Well, let me ask you a question. Let's say you walked into St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, and inside that building, there was one person praying. What matters more to God? We talked about this last week. What matters more to God, the building or the person? What's worse, if St. Peter's Basilica burns to the ground or that one person goes to hell, what's worse? When Jesus came, it was out with the old sacred places. Let's go back to the woman at the well story. The woman asked Jesus a theological question about sacred places. And what does Jesus say? She says, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Where is the right place to worship? This mountain or this mountain? And what does Jesus say? He says, out with the old and in with the new. Now we worship in spirit and truth. What does Jesus tell Peter? Now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Do you know what the worst word in this passage is? It's not the word you think. It's the word church. It is. You know why? 
because Jesus did not say the word church. How do I know? Because the word church is German. <laughs> Jesus isn't German. <laughs> church is the German word for the Lord's house. The word that is written in the text is the word ecclesia, which is another word for congregation. It means an assembly of people. In other words, the short version of the story is, Jesus says, who am I? Peter says, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus says, yes. And that statement, that confession of faith, will be the cornerstone. It will become the foundation upon which I build my people. That's what the text says. Jesus' church was new because you could not go to Jesus' church. Jesus did not build Temple 2.0. He made something entirely new because you are the church. We are the church. When this building has no people in it, it is not the church. It is just a building. So how do we do in with the new. Jesus' church has to care more about people than buildings. We need to spend more time and more money on discipleship and evangelism than we do on lawn care and toilet paper. We need to look forward more to seeing people and not the pew that they sit in. We need to spend more time together than we do apart. How did Jesus' church, first church do it? Acts 2 says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together, and all had things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Friends, this is how you do the church of Jesus. Living and loving together. Do you think this church, the people in this congregation, they knew each other's names? Absolutely. They were welcoming each other into each other's homes. Yes, that they shared their struggles together, shared their tears together, shared their joys together, shared their successes together. Jesus' church does things together. Bible study together, eating together, worship together, even helping each other, even financially. And what happened? The last verse says, God grew their numbers. Do you know how many books are written about how to grow your church. Every famous pastor thinks they've got the answer. I've got several in my own library. They're all garbage. They're garbage because the answer is right here. When you are invested in other people's lives, when you care about your brother and sister, when you see them, welcome them, love them, invest in them, the church will grow. God will bless his church. So how about the last one? How did Jesus change punishment? In Luke 22, we see Jesus share the Passover meal with his disciples. It says Jesus took the cup and after they had eaten, he said this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. The old covenant required the blood of an animal to be sacrificed every single time you sin. It was this cycle of sin and death. Jesus stopped all of that. Out with the old, in with the new. His blood was the last blood that was offered for sin. And when Jesus said these words, he had removed his rabbi clothes and he had adorned himself with a towel and he washed his friend's feet. What is the picture that you see in your head? What is the visual that Jesus wants us to see? No more robes, right? This is now about service. This is an act of love. How do we know Jesus was the last sacrifice? 
How do we know he changed everything and made it new? He gave that answer at Passover. He said, from now on, do this in remembrance of me. Do what? Passover. Right? Out with the old, in with the new. Wait, what? This is the largest Jewish holiday. This was Christmas for them. This is their Christmas, okay? The Jews have been celebrating Passover for 1,400 years. And it's to remember that Moses delivered them out of Egypt. That's why we celebrate this, to remember that Moses liberated us from Egypt and took us to the promised land. Passover is about homecoming. The bread was a symbol of the unleavened bread that they ate on their journey. And in this moment, Jesus says, no, 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 nope. Now this is about me. Can you imagine if someone said that today about Christmas? They changed it and they said, no, 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 no. From now on, this is about me. Would you be on board with that? Jesus changed the significance of Passover. Talk about a change. He changed everything. The arrival of Jesus changes everything. That means his church today should be just as new as he is. We should have a new message, a new voice. But we've held on to old temple words, old temple practices, and most of those things are the reason that people don't like coming. So I say out with the old, in with the new. Let's re-embrace the church that Jesus had in mind. Before he died, he showed us what this new would look like. John 13 says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. And by this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. How are we to be known? By loving each other. Is that how the church is known today? It should be. Tell me something. Do you place this new commandment of Jesus above the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament? Because Jesus said he already fulfilled those. Jesus says, I come to fulfill the law and the prophets. And then Jesus says, this is how I want the world to know you. This, this is the reputation that you should have as being people who love each other. The church is loving hands and loving words. Not known for going to a building, not even known for reading the Bible. Our reputation isn't built by what color the building is on the outside or how great your pastor is. Our reputation comes from love. Loving God and loving each other. In with the new. Let's pray. Lord, help us to be obedient of this new commandment. Help your church to be known as ones who love all people so that all people know that you are our king. May that be the message of the church. May that be the reputation of the church the love we have for one another, and our message that Jesus is King, that Jesus is the answer, that he is the last word, that he is the last high priest. Lord, if there is any that still hold on to old, because old is so hard to let go of, we just ask for your forgiveness. Ask that you free us and help us to embrace new. Help us to re-embrace what you had in mind. 
to let go of old temple words and old temple practices and be the church that you would have us be, a church with a new message and a new voice. Amen. Well, as always, I invite you to come to our congregation. Our church meets on Sunday. Of course, we have two services, one at 9.30. That's our traditional service. We're going to sing songs out of the hymnal. We're going to do responsive reading, say the Lord's Prayer, have communion. It's going to be all the things that you remember about church as you grew up. And then our 11 o'clock service is our contemporary service. We have a worship team, come casual. It's also a good time to bring your children. We have a children's program from birth all the way through high school. We want to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys soon. Bye.